We're going to take a reading from the book of Luke, chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 7 and read down to verse 20. It says this, speaking of Mary. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were, in the same country, shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. I'll conclude our reading this morning. And um, we're going to put a title on the message today. And that is, Rejoice, Our Savior Was Born. Rejoice, Our Savior Was Born. I love reading through that scripture. Um, the last couple of weeks I've read over the Christmas story, I guess you would call it, uh, many times. And um, perhaps more than it has in the past, one of the things that really jumped out to me this time was how much rejoicing that there was surrounding the birth of Jesus. God in His Word directs us at times that we're to put forward certain attitudes at certain periods of time. Uh, When we come in a few weeks to take the Lord's Supper, there is a somberness that we're going to exhibit uh, because we're to consider the Lord's death as He came. And it ought to be, if we're in the right frame of mind, a very humbling thing. Um, There are other occasions, I suppose Easter is one of celebration. Um, that our God is different from all other gods in that he died and he rose from the grave. And no one else can boast that truth about their God. Here, as I was reading this over the last number of weeks and began to consider these thoughts, this is a time of rejoicing. Um, Because this was the first, I, I guess, and I say this very loosely, This was the first domino that fell. Obviously, there were things that took past or took place in eternity past, but from the human element, from the human standpoint, everything else that was going to take place throughout Jesus' life and all that he was going to accomplish had to begin somewhere. And it began here. And this morning, as we read through this scripture text and we consider the truths that we find here, as well in the book of Matthew, about the birth of our Savior. I hope today, as we go through this season, that if you do anything, you're compelled to rejoice at the wonderful gift that God gave us in his, the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, and I love, I love this whole story because God illustrates things about Himself throughout the whole Christmas story that we come to learn in greater fullness later on through the New Testament. And I believe the first can be seen both in this text as well as what precedes it and what comes after it, and that is who he came to. 
that Jesus, unlike so many of us, where perhaps we gravitate towards the opulent, towards the popular, towards people of note and rapport, and we try to run with different groups that might gain us a certain status. And Jesus didn't come that way. Jesus did not come to Herod or Augustus Caesar. Jesus did not come or God did not send him to come to the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the the high priest's home or the Sanhedrin or even somebody that we could read later on like Nicodemus who was a man of great learning. But what we find is that Jesus all through this whole account that he came to a group of humble people, lowly people, meek people who As we read through this story and as we notice various things, what we're going to see is that these people's hearts were focused on the right things about God and about the coming Messiah. Whilst other people were looking for a Messiah to come with great power and overthrow the Roman government, while other people were looking for a man in the same nature as Saul, the king, the first king of Israel, who the Bible says that his stature was so great that his head was above all the other men's, or his shoulders were the other men's heads. That's not the way that these people were looking for the coming Messiah. But rather these people We're looking for something more than what the eye could perceive. And because they were wanting something spiritual, God revealed and showed the greatest gift mankind could ever have to these humble people. I'll contend this morning that God does the same today. God reveals himself to us when our hearts are humble and really desiring to see him for who he is. Here, I want us to notice as we go through these few verses and and we talk about some of these things that who the people were that all rejoiced at Jesus coming. We find the first one being his own mother Mary. Now, for some reason, I always have, and on Friday I talked about this at the chapel services, but to me, Mary and the spirit of Hannah, Samuel's uh, mother, They're just very linked to me. I think it's because of the way that they prayed. There is this deep humility in the way that Mary portrays herself to the Lord and to the angel of the Lord. The things, the the little that we have left behind about who she was and what she did. But God came down to this this young, humble, virgin woman and he sends his angel Gabriel to come and to announce that this wonderful thing which had been prophesied for approximately 400 years all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the Bible gives us the first prophecy of the coming Messiah that he would come through the womb of a virgin and so for generations and for thousands of years prophets and kings and all numbers of people are awaiting this triumphant entrance of the Messiah to come and prophecy after prophecy is layered one upon the other about who he's going to be and what he's going to be accomplished and yet when God comes he sends his, his, his angel Gabriel into the home of this woman and he reveals to her what he's going to do because she was a meek and a humble, lowly servant of the Lord. Some people speculate that she was as young as 16, 17 years old. I don't know how old she was, but she was likely very young. And the angel appears to her and he tries to greet her in a salutation that is disarming. And yet she's pretty overwhelmed by what she's saying, and she's afraid. And the Lord says, you have found great favor in the sight of God. He continues to tell her the story. And what always amazes me about Mary is that, based upon the message that Gabriel gave her, there's a lot of questions that you would have about what would come next. Primarily about your own well-being. Because in Jewish law, you could be stoned for being betrothed to somebody and then being with another man. 
And so she's got all these questions about how people are going to receive her. And all these questions, no doubt, about what her, her uh, espoused husband Joseph is going to, how he's going to respond to these things. And is her life going to be in jeopardy? But after the Gabriel comes and announces that she's going to be the mother of our Lord, what she responds to him is rather overwhelming because she asks one question, and that is, how is this even possible? Just explain to me how this is physically, humanly possible because it completely subverts the natural way of having a child. And when he gives her an answer, her response says, be it according to thy word. I'm your servant. I'm your handmaid. She comes to Elizabeth six months later. Excuse me. She comes to Elizabeth after that moment who is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And as she enters the room, the Bible teaches us that the baby leapt in Elizabeth's womb. I don't understand that. All I know is that the Holy Spirit evidently identified even to a child that there was something special that had taken place, that there was an entrance into that room that was of divine nature, and it caused not only John the Baptist, but Elizabeth to call out in rejoicing and say, who am I that the mother of our Lord should come to my house and to me? She rejoiced. And then Mary, she rejoices. And I love what Mary says. Here's what she says in, in the chapter 1. She says, and Mary said, talking to Elizabeth, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Mary rejoices. Elizabeth rejoices at what God has told them. And then we find that after Zacharias had been made dumb, that after John the Baptist is born, the Bible teaches us that he, the first thing that he utters out, is not amazement at what God did allowing him to speak, but rather that he began to rejoice in the gift that God had given, sending them a Savior. And then it comes to the very night, the text that we read where the shepherds are abiding in a field. I can't imagine, I think of all the people in in this text, either Simeon or these shepherds is who I would have liked to have been. You're out one night, it's cold, it's dark. Sky is black. And then imagine what they saw. Imagine seeing an angel. Just one, one angel come to you and give you a message. I would pre- probably be a lot like Zacharias. I'd be struck dumb, wouldn't you? Not even know what to say. But you know, I've always looked at those angels coming on behalf of God. Here, uh, last week, I think Kathleen made these little cards, and on one side of the card was a Merry Christmas, and on the other side of the card was their birth announcement. It's a pretty typical thing to do is that when you're excited about your newborn child and you want to share it with people you find the people that you love and you send out a birth announcement God did the same God sent forth his only begotten son into the world and he sent angels angelic beings to come and give a birth announcement to the world and they appear after the angel comes and he notifies them that in Bethlehem just a a few short steps from where they were at that this child had been born that he'd been sent from God and then this whole heavenly host appears and they're compelled to begin to rejoice because of what God was doing and had done for the rest of the world. That he was bringing peace where there had previously been no peace. That it was out of God's goodwill that he had sent a savior into the world. He came and he was compelled and these angels were rejoicing. And that caused the shepherds to respond in like kind. They began to rejoice and get very excited. And they run into the town and they begin to spread the news abroad. What God had done to them, probably much to people's amusement, just as during the days of Noah when God shared with him a truth, he comes and many people don't believe him. I would imagine, just like today, if I came to you or somebody very trustworthy came to you and said, I saw an angel, there would likely still be some doubt in your mind and hesitation to believe them. And there they went, spreading abroad. And then they said, you know what, let's go find this child. And they walk in and they leave that place after seeing the Messiah who had been promised for so long. There they leave and they're continuously rejoicing at the coming of Jesus. 
You know what's interesting to me about all the Old Testament prophets, about all the people in the New Testament, is they have no idea the new day that was about to dawn. Like if, if we could just go back, if we could go back 2,500 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, and live for just a few days in these time periods and recognize the utter darkness that the world lived in, even Jewish people who were striving to worship God in the right way, who were following the Old Testament texts that were not accessible to the common people, many people of which were illiterate, they're straining and they're striving to worship the God of heaven in the truth, and yet they're in large part darkness because the Old Testament is just a shadow of the revealed truth that would come and reveal so many things about Jesus the Messiah these people for so long had sat in utter darkness and yet for the past 700 years up to the time of Jesus not only were they in ignorance of mind but then they were also in slavery they were in bondage to all these different groups of people and they know that one day out in the future there is coming a hope and yet that hope as the book of Proverbs tells us was continually deferred the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick and so generation after generation they're hoping as their oppression grows deeper as their ignorance and darker grows greater they're hoping for a light to shine into the darkness and they're believing much to the mockery of many of those nations who mocked the the people who just believed in one true God and for generations they have cried out he's coming someday he's gonna come someday and yet never did he appear until finally this one night The desire of all nations come in the form of a baby. The darkness, I don't don't think, you know, when you live in the light, you don't recognize the power of the darkness because we just live there temporarily. I had a professor, I was talking to Brother Gerald uh, here this week and Sister Mary, and we were kind of talking about some of the professors we had in college. And one of the professors I had in college was uh, in the Navy, and he wanted to, after he retired, right before he retired, I don't remember the whole story, but he wanted to go in a submarine, and the submarine would be underwater for like six months at a time. It would never come up. And so what they would do to train these men before they could let them on that submarine is that they had to spend one whole week in the complete dark. They would bring food to this door, and they'd grab it. Otherwise, they had to just stay in this confined room for a whole week because the idea was... If something ever happens to the submarine and we get where we're stuck somewhere and there's no electricity under it, we don't want people going, haywire, going haywire and doing things that will damage everybody. So at least for a week, you got to live in the darkness. And as he was telling that story of the hours passing by and not knowing how many hours are ahead or how many hours have passed or whether it was daytime or nighttime, I began to think about that scripture that talks about in the 10 plagues where it was a darkness that you could feel. That's how dark it was in Egypt. You ever been in a place, in a cave, where it was so dark that you could feel the darkness and you could reach out and it's almost like you were grabbing something but you weren't? That's the type of spiritual darkness very often that these people laid in for centuries, hoping, waiting, and it never coming. You see, people re- I don't think people rejoice today. You know, the, the, word, the biblical word rejoice is a very... I don't even know how to express it other than to say it's a very bright word. It's not excitement. It's not happiness. It's not a, well, that's great, and then after the day's over, you you fall asleep and you forget about it. That's not what the biblical word rejoicing means. You see, because we don't have great need today, we don't have great rejoicing because those two things go hand in hand. The greatest need we ever find ourselves in is generally medical need. Some one of your spouse or, or one of your family members or perhaps during this tornado you, you can't get a hold of somebody and it perhaps goes for days and you're searching and you're hoping or perhaps the ambulance comes and you're driving behind the ambulance and you're praying and the last time you saw your family member they, you, they look dead to you and they, you're just all these thoughts are going through your mind and they go back behind these closed doors and they're there for hours and you don't hear the doctors and you're calling out to God and you're hoping and you're praying and you have this need and there's no amount of money you can pay there's no bailouts there's no nothing all you're dependent on is God because you need him more than anything these people they had great needs all the time 
when I was in Belize this time, this, this couple weeks or a couple months ago, there was a young man there that was 27 years old, and he didn't have any savings. He spent what he had. He was he was very grateful that I'd come over there, and that uh, another uh, brother Alex Shoulders had come over there. He was very grateful that we came, and he wanted to give us a gift, and so he gifted us something, and. I learned from a different means that he didn't have enough money to buy it, and he didn't have any money saved. And so he gave us his gift, and it's kind of like the the widow with the two mites. I mean, he just spent all he had to show appreciation. And as I was ending my trip there, I had some money that I had taken over to give away to people. And obviously what I was looking for is people had need. He lost a daughter just about a year and a half earlier that was a year and a half old. He now had a son. Unemployment rate through the roof. I saw a man in need. And when I handed him a little bit of an offering to help, the gratitude cannot be expre- it, it, it didn't need to be expressed in words. It was expressed in the embrace and the look in his face. The deep appreciation. Today we exchange gifts, and if truth be told, they don't have a lot of value. And the reason is because we don't have a lot of need. These people, one after the other, had lived in darkness, had lived in despicable need or desperate need, rather. And then, in the middle of that great need, as Zacharias says, the day spring dawns. Another word for day spring is sunrise. In the midst of that darkness, the sunrise, the Messiah, the hope, all the hope that we have in this life and all the hope we have in the life to come, There he is. I mean, can you imagine that? Imagine seeing this little baby. And you know all of your hope. That's why if you notice what Mary called him in her prayer, she rejoiced in God, her Savior, not her son. Before he was a son to her, he was a Savior to her. He looks upon the, she looks upon this little baby. You know, I think she treated him differently than other kids. The other children that she had, by necessity. We tend to think in terms of parents to children that, you know, parents are superior. We have a degree of authority that God has entrusted us with. But in this case, that must have been very strange, shouldn't it? I know I'm entrusted with authority over Jesus, but he's entrusted with authority over me. I know in some cases I'm to provide for him, but he's going to provide everything for me. Imagine being, the Bible tells us of two more people who rejoiced at Jesus' coming, and it was Simeon and Anna. You know what I love about the story of Simeon is that he was a devout man. That means he was a, a highly righteous man is what the Greek means in that. It's saying not he's devout in his religious devotion. Right? He has a very dedicated He's just, he does the right thing in short. And he's not looking as other people are looking for the Messiah. And it comes in the words, the way he expresses himself, it comes. You can see that. And God had revealed to him that the consolation of Israel would come. Now, if I remember right in the King James, that C is not capitalized. It ought to be capitalized. Because we know whenever we use the name of God in the Bible, it should be capitalized. And what he's saying is, I'm waiting on the person who will bring relief and comfort, salvation to Israel. That's who I'm waiting on. And God had revealed to him in his prayers, one day, the Messiah, during your lifetime, you're going to get to see him. I would love to have been him. I mean, imagine the excitement every day going to the temple. 
You know, friends, we could have that excitement today if we wanted to because God has promised us that the superior time that we live in is that Jesus is not confined by a flesh. Jesus is not confined anymore by his uh, human weakness. Jesus is not confined by, by time and by space as he willingly submitted himself when he came during the time of Jesus' life. But rather, the Bible teaches us that we live in a superior time frame. Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. And the reason is because through the Holy Spirit, God can be with us at all times that's what the prophecy told us is that his name would be Emmanuel meaning God with us well friends we have Emmanuel here with us every day God with us dwelling and moving the anticipation that he must have had knowing if I go to the temple I might see the Lord's Christ and yet we can share that today We've experienced that in the last year at times, having had a good service, anticipating another one that's coming the next, sun, the next day during revival or the next Sunday. God can grant that excitement, anticipation for us. And Simeon comes. You know, I, I love, because these are evidences of the Holy Spirit to me. You can find evidences of the Holy Spirit through the Old Testament into the Gospels, of course, in the New Testament and Paul's letters. But sometimes it's a little uh, harder to discern in these times. But I love here with Simeon, the Lord, as, as Mary and Joseph went in and they, they fulfilled their customary sacrifice on the eighth day and they got him circumcised. And as they're leaving, it seems to portray, Simeon is moved in his spirit. That's it. I would imagine to Mary and Joseph at first, Simeon probably seemed like a strange old man. <laughs> Come and grabbing that child. But wouldn't you have? Like, wouldn't you have probably dropped all the niceties if you knew that that was the Messiah? That was the one who has been pro- You probably would have said, hi, my name is Simeon. Can I hold your, can I see your child? No, you wouldn't have said that. You would have been in such a state of what? Rejoicing. You ever been at a ball game before, Brother Witty, and you get so excited that you start celebrating with the people around you you don't even know? Right? Start clasping their hands and, and then you look back and you're like, well, that was kind of odd, wasn't it? I got caught up in the moment. I'll bet that's what Simeon did when he saw all of his hope. And here's what he says. It provided for him so much peace. He said, now let thy servant depart in peace. In other words, this. I don't need anything else in life but what I saw right here. I mean, that type of rejoicing goes, extends beyond what words can say. Kathleen will readily tell you that um, the first few years we were married, I was a Scrooge. Um, Like, for real, I was a really big Scrooge, and I still fight the compulsion today. And the reason is very simple. Today, um, pageantry, pomp, circumstance, um, excess, parades, presents, that's the rejoicing that's done in Christmas. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense when you recognize our truest need and what God provided. I'll be honest with you, I feel very strange about giving gifts to my children at Christmas. Because I know as a child, guess what my focus was? I mean, it was the gift. Now, I'm not trying to go extreme here, but what I'm saying is this. I want my children to recognize more fully the great gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ. And in today's world, I don't know how to do that. I'm telling you this, I don't know how to make my children not just give um, words. And we learn what to say. We learn how to decorate the house. But really, is the rejoicing, is the joy deeply felt because of God's gift of his son? I pray it will be. I don't. This morning, I, I feel 
a joy that today you'll notice as these people are talking over and over, both in the first and second chapter of the book of Luke, that one of the things that they keep mentioning is that a light has come. We were in great darkness, and now we have a light. One of the things that I rejoice in in the coming of Jesus Christ is that we have understanding about who he is, what he did, and what he desires to do. We have light. We can see and we can understand what God has done and what he will do in us. These people rejoiced that God had sent forth a light to Israel. And you'll notice in two different places, once by Simeon and once by Zacharias, once by Mary as well, they use the word to all people. That this light has shined to all people everywhere. This morning, I pray, I pray that God will give you the grace in your heart to more deeply appreciate the gift of Jesus Christ. I can't force that on you. I can't force it in myself. But when I see over and over these people all through this period rejoicing, there were even men, a lot of speculation about the the magi or the wise men, and the truth be told, we just don't know much. A lot of speculation in the end. We don't know that much concretely. Here's what we do know. These men came from a long way away. Spent days, weeks, perhaps months traveling, following this light. When they got to Jesus, much uh, different than portrayal is often shown, it wasn't the night he was born. It was probably a long way after that, months after that perhaps. And they get there. After this long months of journey, the Bible says they fell down to their knees and they worshiped. As is always the case, in our scripture text, I'll read one more verse. It was verse 11 of our scripture reading. It says this. If I could could summarize all of Christmas in one verse, what perhaps touches me more deeply than any verse in the Bible about all of Christmas is verse 11 of chapter 2 of the book of Luke. It says this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He gave us a light, but in the end, the greatest thing that God ever gave us is that he gave us a Savior. I have hope today, very sincerely down in my heart, down in my soul, I feel a deep hope. Not about the future of our country, not about the future of our church, not about the future. All those things, that ebbs and flows. Sometimes I feel really positive and like there's, you know, some hope. But you know what is always there? You know a hope that is present, always abides, constantly. It is that God saved me and one day will finish that salvation work. Not saying I got to be saved again, meaning... He saved me, but he's going to complete that whole work one day in eternity. Today, I pray that God would help you and help me to rejoice because Christ was born. And that's the greatest thing that we would ever need. (coughs) Kathleen asks me every year, what do you want for Christmas? And I give her the same answer every year. (coughs) Nothing. I don't want anything. Not that there's wrong with exchanging gifts. I don't have anything wrong with that. But there is a sense to which, haven't we been given the greatest gift in Jesus? And isn't he, as the song says, all that we need? I hope God will implant that in your heart and he'll do that in mind. Does somebody have a word or a testimony on your heart today? That's our message this morning.